Okay, so well, welcome everyone. Uh, so what we are uh, rendering here today is a homage to Terry Fine. Uh, Terence Fine was a, a, well, one of the pioneers, as you all know, of imprecise probabilities. Uh, he passed away at the end of January 2021. Uh, it was at the time a bit uh, too tight to make a homage to him before the conference we held in Granada. Also that conference was hybrid, so it was not probably the ideal format. But uh, luckily we're here today because even at the meeting we had in Granada, uh, Teddy Seidenfeld, well, really told us that we should uh, correct uh, this wrong and we should make a homage. So at least uh, today we can celebrate the life, the work and all the contributions of Terry. Uh, for this, we have some videos from uh, colleagues and from uh, former students, also from relatives. We contacted a number of people and everybody was happy to to participate and also we'll have a live talk here uh, about his work by Teddy Seidenfeld. So we're going to start uh, with a video from a colleague from Stephen Wicker from Cornell University uh, who will be telling us a bit about the career of uh, Terry. Greetings. My name is Steve Wicker. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Cornell University. It is my pleasure and an honor to provide this remembrance of my friend, and my colleague, and my mentor, Terry Fine. Terry left us January 31st, 2021, and it is again an honor to be participating with you. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. But Terry has spoken often of the International Symposium on Imprecise Probabilities, Theories and Applications. He has enjoyed it thoroughly, and um, I'm sure you all will miss him as much as I do. Um, Terry, let me tell you a few things about Terry. First off, he was born in New York City on March 9th, 1939. Terry was very much a person of the city even though he lived in a very rural area, Ithaca, New York, for a good part of his life. Uh, Ithaca is four hour drive roughly from New York City and uh, definitely a lot more rural, but he did make it into the city often. Uh, that's where his family was and that is where he was initially educated. His bachelor's degree in 1958 was from the City College of New York he then went to a slightly less urban place, Harvard, uh, for his subsequent degrees, getting his PhD in 1963. I'll come back to this, but his, his thesis was on statistical delta modulation, a technology that's still of great interest. His advisor was Don Tufts. His next step after Harvard was to take the Miller Institute Junior Research Fellowship at Berkeley. This was in 1964, and he was at Berkeley for two years before joining Cornell's School of Electrical Engineering in 1966. Uh, back then, we were called the School of Electrical Engineering, now the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, a change that did not thrill Terry, I'll mention that. And uh, I'll talk about a number of the things that uh, he participated in, in including uh, the great debate over that name change as time goes on. So he joined us at Cornell, now ECE. He was at Cornell from 1966 until 2010, one of our longest serving faculty. Uh, as a faculty member, he graduated 21 PhD students, some of whom I believe are in the audience right now. Uh, Terry was always a strong advocate of the school's, school's teaching mission. He did quite a bit to help evolve our teaching curriculum. Over time, he was a member of our Curriculum and Standards Committee, one of our busiest committees, a very active member, and he was the chair of our Policy Committee for a number of years. The Policy Committee literally creates the policies by which we thrive as a, uh, as a school. So um, he had a strong role. And in fact, he never chaired the department, but he was an associate director. And I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, he participated in numerous hiring committees, uh, continuing the growth of the school. I had the pleasure actually of serving with him on both 
hiring committees, policy committees, and promotion committees, in which we considered younger faculty for promotion and tenure. And uh, he was very active and very supportive of younger faculty. I'll come back to that. At a uh, level above the department, Terry also participated in academic integrity hearings, dealing with some of the issues that arise when our students don't do what they're supposed to do. And Terry was a longtime men member of the Cornell Faculty Senate. He was a great believer in faculty governance, and he was a strong voice on many issues at the uh, university level. But again, he was also a passionate voice at the faculty of uh, ECE level. Uh, we could always count on him for a well thought out discussion of certain topics. Now, I mentioned this a moment ago. At Cornell, Terry served as the director of the Cornell Center for Applied Mathematics. He was uh, the head of that particular group. One thing about Cornell that might need some explanation, Cornell works on a committee system. Um, individual PhD students can um, collect members as they wish for their committee. The committee determines how the PhD process will progress. And you can come up with some pretty creative stuff if you've got the right PhD student. Well, the Center for Applied Mathematics plays a strong role in this. This is purely a graduate department. It's a collection of PhD students who want to uh, focus on applied mathematics and perhaps include other fields as well. And those fields could be, for example, computer science, electrical engineering, uh, economics. Uh, there's, there's many different fields that have been included under this umbrella. So being the director of the Cornell Center for Applied Mathematics required a great deal of flexibility. And Terry was very good at his job and he held it for five years. Uh, he was also the associate director of ECE, the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His primary responsibility as associate director was to deal with the teaching program. That was the main thing. He made sure the right courses were being taught and taught by the right people. He assigned TAs, teaching assistants, and dealt with academic actions involving students. So very busy job, and uh, he really was good at it. It was only illness that kept him from serving a much longer term. But he did serve for two years and had a strong impact. Now let's talk about his research. Uh, that's primarily what we're celebrating today, as I understand it, and it is certainly worth celebration. He's had some significant contributions. Um, his PhD dissertation work is still noted. Again, it dealt with statistical delta modulation. Just a quick reminder, delta modulation is a form of compression in which we only transmit the changes in the signal as opposed to the signal itself. And this was a particularly powerful technology for what was known as cordless telephony. Uh, cordless telephony is not as prominent, but some of the technologies that were involved in it are still in use in various other technologies today. Well, what Terry did was he developed a particular kind of quantizer for delta modulation uh, that was published 20 years later in a book that's still available, available, Recursive Source Coding. And Terry's contribution has become known as the Fine Macmillan Recursive Quantizer. So um, number one, well, let's just say the first of Terry's contributions. There are more, as you are all well aware. Probably Terry's best known contribution was in the area of the foundations of probability. Uh, this was an enduring theme of his research. He was very interested in what it meant to make statements about probability. He discussed the interpretations and meanings of probabilistic statements, whether there was objective or subjective bases for this. Um, he could get quite excited about the topic, as some of you know. Uh, he developed a number of mathematical structures and was particularly interested in those that did not treat probability as a real number. But he would only go so far in that. Uh, he was very critical, for example, of fuzzy logic. 
Uh, there was a long-running debate that he had with uh, Lofty Zeta, the, the founder of Fuzzy Logic. And um, I, I remember hearing about this many times. He, he thought that uh, Fuzzy Logic was just another form of probability. Another thing that would really get Terry excited was the notion that people actually think using notions of uh, probability in a Bayesian manner he would get quite excited. He thought there is no way that this happens. Uh, people don't walk around with um, rules of probability in their heads and make decisions in a Bayesian manner. It's, it's a lot more random. And I think um, many of us would agree with that today. But his work in this area and the foundations of probability was enshrined in his book, Theories of Probability an examination of foundations, which was published in 1973. Now, if you look to the left, you'll see a copy of the book. It's in the hands of Kolmogorov. Uh, this was a 1973 symposium in which Terry gave Kolmogorov uh, a copy of his book, and apparently Kolmogorov had nice things to say about it. Now, what we are probably most excited about in terms of Terry's contributions for our current group is his work on upper and lower probabilities. And he did this work with one of his students, Peter Wally. Uh, this paper towards a frequentist theory of upper and lower probability has become a classic. I know a number of my colleagues have uh, further developed this work. I'll particularly note Joe Halpern in computer science at Cornell who has written a book on reasoning under uncertainty that is based in part on the work in this paper. And so here you see an, an er, relatively early, I guess it's about 40 year old uh, picture of Terry with his then student, uh, Peter, Peter Walling. Now, one thing many of you may not know is that Terry had a patent. Um, I am pleased to be a co-inventor on this patent. It stemmed from some work that Terry, Joe Halpern, and I did for the National Science Foundation on sensor theory and sensor deployment and the use of sensors as a basis for improving communication systems. Well, this particular patent has to do with sensor-assisted aloha uh, for wireless networks and, and in particular for... Um, for cellular networks, which was a particular interest of mine. So we start with the basic notions of Aloha. Here's a dynamic model for Aloha. As you know, there are three equilibrium points, two stable and one unstable. Uh, we'd like to avoid the equilibrium point on the far right. So we want to stay as much as we can to the left of the unstable equilibrium point in the middle. So one of the ways we avoid going beyond this equilibrium point is by well-crafting our back-off algorithm. We want to allow for a back-off window, the amount of time we wait to retransmit. Um, we want to make sure that that window is somehow a function of the number of people who are trying to retransmit. So Terry crafted a neural network that would fit into this context. You see the network on the right and trained it, and we were able to show that we could improve the performance of an Aloha network uh, by measuring energy transmissions and determining the number of people that were backlogged. It was a lot of interesting work, a lot of fun, and like I said, we got a patent out of it. Now, Terry did a lot of service beyond Cornell, and in particular, a little known fact, uh, well, it was known that he was president of the IEEE Information Theory Group, 1988 to 1989. But the little known fact is that was the last year that the Information Theory Group was a group. It became a society the next year. And so he was the last president of the Info Theory Group. He was also an associate editor, as many of us were, for the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory. He served twice in two different areas. Uh, he was a member of a number of administrative committees dealing with, for example, the transactions on neural networks and a founding member of the Neural Information Processing Society. And again, probably most important to us today, he was a member of the Society for Imprecise Probability from its founding in 2002. 
Terry's teaching was very notable. He taught probability theory a lot because none of us could say we could teach it as well as he did. Uh, the students had to work hard and there was occasional complaining, it's too hard, but they knew probability theory when they, if they got through the class. Um, Terry also created several other courses, including a signals and systems course and a mathematics of electrical engineering course, uh, all of which are still taught. Uh, he received the 1990 Merrill Presidential Scholar Outstanding Educator, educator uh, note, and he also was the Ruth and Joel Spira uh, Teaching Award recipient in 1998 uh, to 1999. So that is an ECE award. He's being recognized as one of our best instructors. He also received the College, College of Engineering Excellence in Teaching Award in 96 and 2002. Now, it is estimated that Terry taught more than 2,500 students during his teaching career at Cornell. Uh, in particular, his teaching of probability theory was a requirement. Uh, he's taught just about every electri electrical engineer we graduated uh, over the course of his career. Now, I want to talk about some personal things now. Terry was a true friend and a mentor. Here is a very young faculty member in, let's see, 1996. I still ate a lot more back. I ate a lot more back then than I do now. And Terry was very good to me and very good to a number of other junior faculty. He was always happy to adopt us and help us see our way through the system. Uh, he gave me some really good advice over the years and I can still hear his words on a number of issues. So he was a good person to have as a colleague and a mentor, and I'm particularly grateful for that. Uh, he was also a devoted husband. Um, I'm sorry, Dorian can't be here. Dorian, fine. Uh, I, I can't say enough about her, but uh, they had a wonderful relationship, the two of them, and uh, very supportive. And finally, Terry was a father. And uh, this is a picture from a very long time ago. Those of us who remember Terry in his older years uh, find it a little interesting to see him actually carrying around his son and uh, enjoying a hike and all that sort of thing. And I, I like to think of him like that, as well as the same man who was so supportive to me in his later years. Uh, Terry was a very good person. He was a, an educator, a researcher, but above all, a good person, and he will be sorely missed. If you have any questions for me, obviously it's kind of hard to do remotely, but um, I'd be happy to take email questions or comments, corrections, rebuttals, uh, whatever you wish. But again, it's been my honor to um, tell you a little bit about Terry, my experience with him at this at this particular symposium. I hope you have a wonderful couple days. Okay, and uh, well, as you saw from the presentation of Stephen Wicker, he had, uh, Terry had 21 PhD students. Okay, it was the, well, we tried to trace them, but it was hard in many occasions to, to find a way of contact them. The one that uh, probably you're familiar with is uh, Peter Wally that unfortunately uh, couldn't uh, be here today. But we managed uh, to get a few videos from uh, former PhD students of Terry, and uh, we're going to see this now. Hi, I'm Yves Gries, a Swiss statistician, uh, and I got my PhD in 1984 at Cornell University under the direction of Terry Fine. I'm grateful to Enrique to have given me the opportunity to pay my homage to Terry by sharing with you a few thoughts about my time at Cornell with him. Um, how did I meet Terry in the first place? By chance, what else? Um, in 1979, I was a 
just finished my master thesis at Zurich in mathematics and uh, I engaged and started a PhD program. I didn't know exactly the direction, was it something for me or not. I was interested in the foundations of statistics in philosophy of science. There was an interesting conference in Germany, in Hanover, with the title, a really long title, uh, Sixth Congress on Logic, International Methodology and Philosophy of Science and Technology. I went there, I had a good conference, and the last day at the conference dinner, my table, there were a few people, didn't know them, but I said, uh, you know, I'm a PhD student in Zurich and I would be interested perhaps one day to have a chance to come to the United States, like for an exchange one year. Six months later, when I opened my mailbox, uh, there was a letter from Stanford. Terry was a sabbatical at Stanford by then. Uh, I still have it, handwritten here by Terry Fine. Yeah. Electrical Engineering Department. Dear Mr. Grease, I have kept you in mind since meeting you in Hanover this past August. I have recently received a substantial long-term grant for research on uncertainty and chance, particularly using lower and upper probabilities. And wonder if you are interested in completing your graduate work for the PhD under my direction in the field of statistics at Cornell University, Ithaca, New York. If you have good grade, I could arrange a graduate research ascension stick, etc. So that's how I met Terry. Thanks to a event of probability zero, we probably changed my life. It's only later that I realized how lucky I'd been to have Terry as my advisor. He was always kind, never criticizing, never asking too much. He wanted, however, a good result in the classes you took, but take few, that's fine. As long as you have an A+, plus, it's okay. Very few courses are needed. Always open for discussion, always his office door open, which actually was a problem sometimes because you had uh, people coming in, out, asking questions. And then he, when he was in thoughts, uh, discussing with me on, on my PhD, he was upset and uh, in order to be quiet, he took his yellow pad and we went together in the dining hall uh, in another building. And uh, actually we, it happened many, very time that in the middle of the afternoon, we were there uh, alone and he was writing on his pad and explaining me what I have to do. Uh, yeah, he was writing from above, right? if you, like that. <laughs> That's how I wrote my thesis with him. When I finished, I had, of course, Gave me my first draft, first few chapters. Next day, he had a little smile and he told me, completely rewrite, <laughs> completely rewrite. Oh, I was shocked, but he was quite right. And since then, I know how important it is to write clearly. Never forgot that. Last time I saw him, that was in Switzerland, in Basel, by then in 1987. Yes, by then I was back in Basel and uh, he wanted to come to Basel uh, with his children. Uh, as probably many of you know, Basel is the town of Jacob Bernoulli, where he wrote the Ars Conjectandi. And he had arranged a visit at the university library, which is not open for anyone uh, to see the original work of Jacob Bernoulli and the law of Nash numbers. So that was the last time I saw him. That was very nice. Uh, my thesis had been on a related uh, upper and lower probabilities and convergence of averages. So it was very nice. After that, we went to eat a Swiss fondue, of course. So I hope you'll come to Basel and visit and pay your homage to Jacob Bernoulli as well. Bye bye. It is difficult to summarize what one thinks or feels about someone in a few words. So I'll focus on three characteristics of Terry Fine. The first one is that he believed in truth. When I was younger, I held the view that uh, truth didn't have anything to do with science. And we had many discussions about that. Even now, sometimes I'm more worried about uh, telling an amusing story to a conference audience or a convincing story to a journal editor. Sometimes I'm more worried about publishing than telling the truth. But he wasn't like that. He was really interested in truth, in science, truth. The other characteristic of Terry that I remember is that he was a teacher, an advisor, a true advisor. 
I remember that I was quite interested in uh, an idea of uh, the impossibility of computing precise probabilities. And I was stuck for months with a proof that I couldn't find for a theorem that was fundamental for that idea. <laughs> so once he came by with a few sheets of paper, handwritten, and he told me, this is half of the proof of your theorem. Now move forward. He helped me with my proof, and he helped me and guided, guided me to move forward. Sometimes I try to do the same with my students, although it's difficult to follow the path of your teacher. And the third characteristic is that Terry was a good person who cared, who cared about others. I always remember <laughs> that my skin didn't find winter in Itaca easy. So every winter had my hands bleeding and anyone could have ignored it or just telling, he could have told me, uh, Pablo, wear gloves. No, he came by and brought a hand cream for my hands. He cared about even those details. So Terry was a scientist who cared about truth assigned an advisor that guided his students and he was a good person. Hello, I am Sayan Dev Mukherjee and I was Terry's graduate student from 1991 to 1996. It was a privilege and an honor to be requested by Enrique to record this little video and uh, his request uh, set off a flood of happy memories. But the one that really stands out to me about Terry is Terry's utter unwavering integrity. To give you just a few examples, um, when I was his graduate student, uh, Terry was uh, completely engaged in working on uh, artificial neural networks, uh, which we now call deep learning models. However, he never um, subscribed to the hype that was then uh, going on uh, in this subject. I remember once where another faculty member in the department um, wanted to um, co-author a um, research grant uh, application with Terry to uh, apply neural networks to solve some, uh, some existing problem. And uh, Terry was trying to talk him out of it, uh, saying that the processes and the mechanisms um, behind uh, that problem were uh, actually well known to subject matter experts and that therefore neural networks would be uh, the wrong choice uh, as a solution and conventional statistical techniques should work better. Um, Terry, of course, never subscribe to the idea that you should uh, massage a uh, you know collection of mediocre data until you have a mediocre publication just in order to have one more publication um now this uh, commitment to integrity uh, extended to uh, his teaching responsibilities as well um one amusing consequence of that was that um uh, he actually put in the effort to teach himself tech. And this was in the days before even the LaTeX macros were uh, written. Um, he taught himself tech so that he could uh, typeset and print out uh, the uh, class handouts so that his students uh, would not have to rely solely on his, uh, unfortunately, nearly incomprehensibly bad <laughs> handwriting on the board. 
Now, uh, this uh, commitment to integrity extended to his uh, personal life as well. Um, uh, he uh, is one of the few people I know who subscribe to both of his hometown papers, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, so that he could get a balanced assessment of uh, daily events and the news. Um, all in all, uh, Terry's example of uh, integrity in research and in uh, one's mode of thinking um, in all aspects of life is something that I have tried to carry with me uh, through my uh, subsequent research career. Uh, and uh, with that, I shall stop. Uh, thank you. It was with great sorrow and a deep sense of loss that I learned about Professor Fine's passing away in early 2021. Knowing that he was very sick in a hospital in Rochester, I and my family had planned to visit him and Dorian Fine in September 2020, but due to the COVID pandemic, we had to cancel our plans. I was Cherry's PhD student from 1977 to 1981. From his courses that I had attended, I was inexorably drawn to theory and the Terry's way of thinking. During the three years that followed, my interaction with Terry shaped my approach to research forever. He had very few PhD students at any point of time, usually just about two, and used to interact very closely with us. So many of his statements still ring true in my ears, and they appealed so much to me that I have repeated them to my PhD students, student after student. In particular, the emphasis on getting to the foundations, rather than just turning the crank to solve yet another problem. And by corollary, the importance of leaving a PhD student alone to do his own thinking, at least in the last several months, rather than guide too closely. He took me to Stanford when he was on a sabbatical there, and I got the opportunity to interact with Terry very closely for a period of an entire year. That was the formative year for the ideas in my PhD thesis. But I also fondly remember those bike rides in the hills near Stanford campus and strolled through the campus, we usually ended in coffee and a donut. The four and a half years at Cornell, under the mentorship of Professor Terry Fine, were extremely important milestones in my life. My deepest condolences to Dorian and other members of the family. May Terry rest in peace. Hi, I'm Adrian Papamarku at the University of Maryland with a warm greeting to the colleagues at the symposium, as well as a big thanks to Enrique Miranda for putting together this tribute to the life and work of Terry Fine. I first met Terry when I joined Cornell in August of 1981, and for the following six years, I was fortunate to have him as advisor, mentor, and friend. Terry was a brilliant, very charismatic teacher who valued depth and substance over volume and flash. Um, as an incoming graduate student with a typical engineering background, I did not expect to work on foundations. Um, yet Terry's enthusiasm and passion for the subject transformed what seemed esoteric at first into something that was both fascinating and vital. Um, to his students, Terry was as tireless in talking about problems and possibilities as he was patient, understanding, and above all, very human. Uh, the door to his office was always open, and uh, whenever he'd venture into hours, as often as that was, it still felt like a privilege. Terry has had a huge influence on my teaching, my scholarship, and, and life trajectory. He um, supported and guided me at times when motivation and, and self-confidence made all the difference. I will always remember him as somebody who gave to others more than he received. And I'm sure that anybody who knew him uh, would never forget him. Thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. Okay, and now uh, we're going to have a, a live talk.
uh, by Teddy, who is going to discuss uh, well, some aspects of the work of uh, Terry. So, Thank you, Enrique, for such a... What I'd like to do is take a few minutes with you, 10 or 15, no more than that, to try and follow a strand in Terry's thinking. Originally, I thought we could find it in the book, because the book is now 50 years old. But in fact, the book was just the beginning point for the strand that I want to discuss with you and Terry. Let me, let me take you through it. So first, I want to remind you that we have a wonderful tr tradition in this society of setting up memorials to celebrate the life of the significant teachers and leaders we've had. This will be the fourth. We've already had one for Henry and Isaac and Kurt. And those of you who knew these people will remember how we celebrated. I think this carries on that tradition wonderfully. Terry uh, wrote a book, Theories of Probability, in 73. We're 50 years since. And what I'd like to do is put one of our former uh, leaders uh, against Terry. And so I'm going to read to you a, a remark that Henry Kyberg wrote. You can find this on the ASIPTA webpage. Um, and the reason I want to write it is because Henry, who started his career in the 50s working on interval value probability, looked at this book and was a bit disappointed with it. So I want to just, I will use one of our memorial speakers to stimulate the discussion with another. So let me just take a few, few sentences, minutes to, to read to you uh, these remarks. So this is Henry Kyberg writing 1999 for the start uh, of the Ghent conference uh, about Terry. So he says, Terry's well-known work theory of probability provides a careful analysis of probability developed step-by-step step from qualitative to comparative relations to quantitative relations. He examines the claims of Keynes and then Koopman, and I mention this to you because Henry's thesis was on Keynes and Koopman. And so when he makes this complaint, it's a very personal complaint for Harry, Henry. So he says, uh, uh, he, he, referring to Terry, refers the claims of Keynes and Koopman, but very early on in this development, of Terry's development, even for comparative probability, assumes that probability relation is complete for any two propositions, either one is more probable than the other, or they're equally probable. This is, doesn't hold for Keynes uh, or for Koopman. Indeed, it precludes interval valued probabilities. So you see, on, Henry's remarks in 99 are saying, this is not the Terry Fine of interval valued probabilities, this book. And then uh, he, he concludes by saying, in a later work, for example, Fine 88, we'll talk about that, interval valued probabilities are strongly advocated. So the question which I thought we could take a few minutes to come to understand is, how and why did Terry move in 15 years from his 73 position, where IP was at best incidental to his later position where IP was strongly advocated. And in doing this, I'd like to also bring to life what I always felt Terry was saying to me and to others in the program, that we were too timid. And I think we can use Terry's own work to see how, how he would continue to tell us that we don't have sufficiently broad vision about how we want to be modeling uncertainty. Whoops. So these are two paragraphs that end the book. Let me read a few sentences from them so you'll see. So imagine, here you've written this significant book reviewing many interpretations of probability, not focusing on imprecise probability, qualitative, quantitative, algorithmic complexity, and so on. He says, he says um, 
This is from the last section of the last chapter of the book. Reflection upon the many difficulties that beset current theories of probability leads us to wonder whether we can dispense with probability and use alternative methodologies to carry out our tasks. So this is someone writing a book on probability and saying maybe we ought to leave probability behind. In support of such a position is the observation that probably probability by itself has not been sufficient for most applications. Um, let me let me just jump. This is the very concluding from concluding paragraph in the book. Judging upon the many difficulties that beset current theories of probability leads us to wonder whether we can dispense with probability and use alternative methodologies to carry out a task. In support of such a position is the observation that probability by itself has not been sufficient for most applications. And he talks about the fact that, that um, uh, you, the applications and statistics are supplemented with many features that are not related to probability. So he says, why not ignore the complicated and, and, and hard to justify probability statistics structure and proceed, quote, directly to those perhaps qualitative assumptions that characterize <coughs> our source of random phenomena, the means at our disposal and our task. This suggestion, while it has a radical element, has a long tradition to support it, and examples of non-probabilistic approaches are really easily found. And then he concludes by saying, much remains to be understood about random phenomena before technology and science can soundly and rapidly advance. It is not only the laws of today that may be in error, but also our whole conception of the formulation and meaning of the laws. And he means statistical and probability laws. So I found this a rather surprising conclusion by a, of a book where someone was devoting himself to trying to give foundations of probability. And the message at the end of the day is maybe we can do better by sidestepping this framework and going back and thinking about more fundamental ideas. And I think what Terry means here and what he would, in my ears I can hear him say, what he would still be pushing us to do is illustrated by uh, at least a selection of his papers. I won't read this, you can read this. But there are three themes illustrated here and I'd like to take the balance of the time to talk about these three themes. Non-additive, quantitative representative representation of comparative probability. That is using non-finite me measures that are not finitely, even finitely out of probability to represent comparative probability. Terry's hostility, I would put it that way, to the kind of decision theoretic basis for the treatment of uncertainty that we see amongst those of us who follow the tradition of say Definetti, who see the decision theory as the basis. And last, the use of undominated interval value probabilities with chaotic relative frequencies. I'll fill in the details a bit. So let me just give you a bit about theme one. So the qualitative probability relation as formulated initially by Definetti takes the quantitative concepts and replace them by a qualitative binary relation. So four axioms, let me just review them with you so you'll see what we're talking about. So the first axiom is that you can compare elements by a qualitative notion of one of ele element not being more probable than another. No connection to de decision theory or betting. And that this forms a weak order. So it's transitive and any two elements are compared. This is what Henry was complaining about. Axiom two says that the empty set and the universal set, the empty event and the, and the tautology are the endpoints of this, of this linear or qualitative array. There's non-triviality, the universal event is strictly more qualitatively probable than the empty. And then the axiom that's intended to capture the finite additivity part, if you have C as an event disjoint from each of A and B, then A is not more probable than B, if and only if when you conjoin them both with C, A union C is not more probable than B union C, an additive disjoint component. That was Definetti's formulation. And the question, which was a very rich question is, what's the relation between this qualitative notion of uncertainty and quantitative representations? And there are two concepts here which are familiar to us. One is that a finitely additive quantitative probability may fully agree with a qualitative one if the quantitative inequalities match the qualitative ones. The almost agreement is it goes one way. So whenever you have 
a strict quantitative inequality that would force the strict qualitative one. But equality of quantitative one may be insufficient. That is, the quantitative ones may be equally probable. You may say P of A is equally probable with P of B, but the qualitative one might be more informative. So the quantitative one might be less. Now, famous paper, 1959, Kraft, Pratt, Seidenberg, showed that even in the finite case, qualitative probabilities may lack even almost agreeing ones. And if you want to figure out what kind of qualitative assumptions you need to add, you have to add infinitely many uh, strong additivity conditions if you want to capture all finite structures. Now, what did Terry do in the light of this, not in the book, but afterwards. With Gill, he set out to try and enumerate the combinatorics of the qualitative ones to see which ones had agreeing and which ones dis didn't. How often do the qualitative orderings have even almost agreeing ones? And uh, they, uh, Gill and, and Fine were unable to give exact solutions but they were on the way to proving, I think it's still unproven, but I, they were on the way of proving that the ratio of the, uh, of, of the qualitative orderings that admit a quantitative agreeing one goes to zero as the, as the number of atoms in the structure increases. So if you're interested in qualitative probability, the qu ones that have matching quantitative ones are of shrinking frequency. You ought to develop techniques for representing the qualitative rankings that don't have quantitative agreeing ones. And that, I think, is the first theme that, that Terry would say. say. You have all these qualitative notions. They're meaningful notions of uncertainty. The quantitative probabilities are not going to capture them. OK, so the next was the shift to the use of interval-valued quantitative representations. They're not the additive form. They're subadditive. They're, 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 they're uh, superadditive on the joint and at the lower end and subadditive on the upper. So the axioms for the um, uh, upper and lowers, we all, we've all seen them, these are just directly lower and upper probabilities thought to be related to the qualitative relation is that the lower probability, these are now quantitative numbers. We're using uh, numbers to assign to the events, pairs of numbers, lower and upper. They're between 0 and 1. And the lower is not greater than the upper. The upper is fixed at 1, and the lower is fixed at 0. And then we have the, sub, the super additivity for disjoint union and the sub for lower probability and the sub additivity of disjoint union for upper probability, and the conjugacy. So the lower probability of an event is the upper of its complement. And now the question is, what's the relation between these upper and lowers and sets of probabilities? And this was the work that I believe was uh, uh, where Peter came in, Peter Wally came into the scene. And so let me just give you this reminder that uh, we can, the, the concept of do dominance here is that a precise quantitative probability dominates a lower if the quantitative probability is always assigning a number at least as high as the lower overall events in the space. And let, for, the, for, for a qualitative uh, uh, inequality, for a qualitative lower and upper probability, let's say, let's call M of P the possibly empty set of dominating precise probabilities for the lower probability. The set is an envelope if not only does it have a, a dominator, but the set of dominators determine those intervals of lowers and upper. So the lower probability is a lower envelope if the lower probability is the infimum of the dominators. And that's the kind of representation we're used to. The behavioral content of this, the elementary decision theory was that the lower probability would be the supreme buying price and the upper probability the infimum selling price. Oh, I'm turning this in. Now. Thank you very much. And, the, and then the, the, the Wally and Fine connection. If you want to avoid sure loss with lower probabilities, 
That is, if you're buying according to your lower probabilities and you want to avoid sure loss, then there must be at least one dominator that sits above. That is, it must be at least one probability in the dominating set. And if you want to have your uppers and lowers work for buying and selling, then in order to avoid loss, these must be envelopes. That is, then the lowers and upper dominators have to match the upper and lower probabilities. That is, the uppers and lowers of the dominators. But, and in the spirit of what Terry did with the qualitative, he didn't go after those. He went after the upper and lower probabilities, which were undominated. Let me show you. He's not scared by, by the threat of sure loss. So why, why the special interest in undominated lower probabilities? It's because Terry thought these were the ones that were needed for handling certain kinds of chaotic uh, 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 sequences, chaotic uh, uh, models. And how does he avoid sure loss? I have just two slides left, and I offer these speculatively. So this is quoting Terry. We use the sets of measures. These are now undominated. So there are lower and upper probability, but you don't have pro numerical probabilities agreeing with them. We use sets of measures to model stable, although not stationary in the traditional stochastic sense, physical sources of finite time, seri finite time series data that have highly irregular behavior. The finite time series is the part that I want to mention to you, bring to your attention. So Terry is offering these sets of, of probabilities not, they're not dominators, but he's going to produce a, a, a model of this lower and upper probability in a, in a different way, using sets of aleatory problems. The key is the model doesn't produce this, the aleatory probabilities, these time series model, do not produce the relevant upper and lower envelopes because they don't work on the infinitary part. They model the finite frequencies, but they do not model the asymptotic limiting frequencies. He's prepared to walk away. Terry's prepared to walk away from the consequences of the, of the uh, numerical time series models for the infinitary. Let me just give you this word. I'm almost done. In seeking, this is Terry, in seeking to identify the limit, the, uh, to identify limits to the ability of convention, excuse me, in seeking to identify limits to the ability of conventional numerical probabilities to model non-deterministic phenomena. He means here limits restrictions. I have been particularly struck by a remarkable probability of probability measures for random properties. Stationarity and uniform boundedness of the coordinate variables imply the asymptotic property of almost sure convergence or stability of time averages. He didn't want that. The mathematical theory of probability through stationary convergence or ergodic theorems and the laws of large numbers yields a surprising conclusion about what should be an empirical and contingent issue. He's saying the behavior in these tails, the, the, in the tail field, is an empirical question. It should not be determined in this way by the mathematics, which is modeling the finite part. However, what may be logically impossible for a class of mathematical models, no matter how well entrenched in the scientific and statistical community, need not be physically impossible for an empirical phenomena. Indeed, we believe that the well-studied problem class of flicker noise may provide examples of such, such surprising non-deterministic phenomena. There's no sure loss in the finitary part of his model but he doesn't mandate infinitary dominance principles. So my understanding, this is speculative, others like Williamson and, and, and your students may, may know better, is I think Terry was being quite bold in saying, I'm prepared to ex use these probability models for the finite part, finitary part of the structure. They yield the wrong results, and all these probability models yield the results on the, on the infinitary part because they demand stability of the limit, strong law, stability of the limiting frequencies, and these flickering processes may not have it. He says, if you, if you want me to, to be coherent, I'll be coherent on the finite part. Don't 
bother me about coherence on the infinitary part. And in order to do that, I will show you, if you ask, I'll show you the paper where he actually says, I am not interested in dominance principles on non -simple, with non-simple variables. I think, I think there's a, a decision theory that models this part of what Terry was looking at, but it's not one that I see people working on. It's take Savage's theory, P1 to P6, and drop the ordering assumption so that it becomes interval valued. And if you do Savage P1 to P6 without the infinitary part, I think we begin to see where Terry was working at the time. Anyway, this I offer, and I'll stop here, as uh, a, an example of his sustained and original use of undominated lower probabilities. He was not scared to use the probabilities that we would all say are sh uh, subject to sure loss, because when you look at the details, the sure loss are sitting off in a mathematical part of the structure, which he's saying, that's not what I'm modeling. I'm modeling this other part and the fact that the sequences may have unbound uh, oscillatory properties and the limits which the mathematical models of the conventional probability would prevent doesn't bother me because I'm not using the models in that part. I'm being incoherent. But I would, he would say, but this is a useful, a useful way to model uncertainty. And it's that kind of boldness in his thinking, his, which I keep hearing in my ears is saying, don't be timid, don't be worried try and see what the empirical process supports by way of the phenomena you're trying to develop. And you may need to break away even more radically from the kinds of sets of probabilities that you used to. Okay, and finally, uh, we have a couple of videos from the, the daughter and the widow of uh, Terry Fine, just to conclude the homage. Thank you for putting together this honorarium for my father, Professor Terence Fine. When I thought about what message I wanted to convey today, I kept returning to the concept of inclusion. When I think back on my childhood, I remember a house full of other professors, graduate students, colleagues, the smell of chalkboards, early computing machines, and being included in my father's professorial activities. It is said that the course of study one pursues determines the lens through which we interpret the world around us. My father's first book, Theories of Probability, was published the year that I was born. I have always been aware of his desire to show me the world through this lens. On my seventh birthday, he gave me a Rubik's Cube. On my bookshelf, I keep a photo of the two of us, me in a ridiculous pink satin dress and him with a broad smile on his face as I proudly display my new puzzle. We would spend hours together on the weekends working to solve the puzzle, discussing permutations and probabilities. All this with a seven-year-old. During the academic year, I would do homework at his office and listen to the complicated conversations with graduate students as my background radio. Weekends, we would go together to the local diner for breakfast. While waiting for our orders, my father would scribble math problems and give us paper napkins for us to solve them on. We would discuss black swan theory and the odds of tossing a copper penny 100 times in a row all tales. The summer before I began high school, we made a trip to Europe. As part of our tour, we went to Switzerland and visited with a previous graduate student and also viewed the Bernoulli papers. In high school, while grocery shopping, I asked whether there were enough calories in the whole store to feed a person for their entire life. Of course, his humorous answer was the probability was 100%. It just depended on how long they would live. We, we took the time together to shop and make approximations of the calories in the store, simplified into a gigantic cube of butter, and found a solution for a nice long life, if not a tasty one. I will spare you the great frustration I suffered one lunch while we argued the Monte Dor problem. While in university, my father visited me when I was studying abroad. 
We went to museums and he proudly posed in front of busts of the great Greek philosophers. During the sidetrack to Delphi, we wound up in a 20 kilometer line of cars. I fretted about what would happen if someone ran out of gas. When I asked him why he was so relaxed about it, he replied, if there was anything to be done, he wouldn't be. Probability of problem, somewhat high. Probability of controlling the outcome, very low. So sit back and enjoy the ride. These are only a few examples of how my father tried to show me the world through his lens. Growing up in an atmosphere of education and teaching left a lifelong impression upon me. My father was always intellectually curious, happy to learn, teach, and share, and both humble and proud of the lives he was able to touch. Even towards the end, he used probability and math to calm a difficult course ahead. He referenced Shakespeare. A coward dies a thousand times, a brave man but once. I will leave you with this. Share your work. Interpret the world of everyday life with your family through your specialty's lens and develop connection and understanding. While I did not go on to study probability, neural networks, or electrical engineering, I am nevertheless grateful for the conversations and the memories. I am grateful to be left with a strong sense of my father's contributions and capabilities in no small part due to this deliberate inclusion. Thank you again for this honorarium. It means so very much that he is remembered so well in such an accomplished and intellectually curious community. I would like to thank Enrique and the entire SIPTA community for paying homage to Terry, my beloved husband, and asking me to speak a few words. I am in California and unfortunately would not be able to be in Spain for this program, and I'm honored that you have asked me to say a few words. I'm recovering from total knee replacement of the right knee. According to Maya Angelou, if you're going to live, leave a legacy, make a mark on the world that cannot be erased. You have no idea what your legacy will be, because legacy is every life you touch. Terry certainly had an effect on those he encountered. Family, extended family, friends, colleagues, students, and even acquaintances. I have letters that were written to Terry 30 years after hiatus thanking him for the positive effect he had on his students' lives. His career is summed up in one single act. Upon coming out of a drug-induced coma in 2004 because of his lymphoma, the first thing he asked for was his computer so he could complete the book he had begun prior to his illness. His wit was very dry and to the point. Some of you may remember the Senate meeting at Cornell where he asked, and I quote, what were you thinking? He took life very seriously and his opinions were much sought after, but not always appreciated. Terry touched many lives during his journey through life, and I was fortunate to have shared over 25 years of the journey with him. Terry was truly a man of many talents, and it is now up to you, the future generations, to carry out his legacy. He will remain in my heart forever. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts with all of you today. Okay, and just uh, to close the homage, we just like to present uh, this book of all photographs of Terry that we're going to send to the family with the signatures of all the participants to the conference. And I would like to thank well, all of you for being here, all the people who contributed to the homage, and in particular, Teddy, for making this possible. Thank you.